Now let's talk about how BMD applies during the mix design phase. Let's start with what is BMD? FHWA Expert Task Group on Mixtures uh, and Construction back in 2015 established this definition. Asphalt mix design using performance test on appropriately conditioned specimens that address multiple modes of distress taking into consideration mix aging, traffic, climate, and location within the pavement structure. What is all that? Basically, BMD is trying to apply a performance test, whether it be cracking, rutting, durability, to a mix, uh, in this case, in the mix design phase, rather than just looking at volumetrics, which doesn't give us any performance characteristics. Um, so why is BMD needed? It's to improve the performance and achieve longer lasting pavements. Uh, as I was saying, volumetrics has a lot of uh, limitations. These limitations can be anything from not being able to show us a difference in the p binder grade that we're using and how it may perform one way or another in a mix. Uh, what about additives? Uh, you know, uh, SPS additive or, or exactly how uh, some additives will impact our, our mix during the life of its performance. It, uh, volumetrics can't capture how RAP or RAS may improve or not improve things, or how a recycling agent may work. So volumetrics uh, has its limitations, and the goal here with BMD is to be able to look at performance characteristics, both during the design phase and production phase of uh, asphalt production. Let's start by one of the main things we do in BMD is we try to balance rutting and cracking criteria. Uh, we balance this through, uh, if you look at this particular diagram, um, rut depth, higher rut depth is bad. You want a low rut depth, so if you're looking at the x-axis along the bottom, you want to be in the first section there. You want to be on the lower end for rut depth. The CT index, that's the nomenclature used basically a way of measuring crack resistance. And in this case, you want the higher number. The higher the, the, the number, the more crack resistant your mix design will be. So as you can tell from this color coding, what we're looking for is something in the top left quadrant that will be both crack resistant and rut resistant. A little bit about the timeline that we've already experienced in going forward in Virginia. Uh, we started looking at BMD back in 2018, doing a lot of research. Uh, around 2019, 2020, there was a lot of uh, equipment began to be purchased. By the end of 2021, we, VDOT had acquired all their equipment, and most of industry has also acquired their equipment needed to be able to do BMD. Since then, we've started doing pilot projects. Uh, pilot projects have been ongoing for several years, as you can see from this diagram. Uh, where we're at now, in 2023, um, we are at initial implementation. We have full specifications that allow BMD mixes to be used uh, on the routes that they apply to. Uh, and there's, this amount of BMD mix designs will only increase as we go forward in 2024 and so on. So what kind of B, there are multiple different kinds of BMD mixes available if you look at the AASHTO specifications. But we're going to focus primarily on what, what Virginia is using. In Virginia, we're, there's two different mixes available. Uh, one is called Performance Plus Volumetric, or P plus V. So when you see an SM9.5 D uh, P plus V, that means this mix is a Performance Plus Volumetric design. And to do that, during the design phase, um, you design your mix to meet all the volumetric and gradation requirements, along with, or in addition to, all the performance tests have to pass. So basically what the, we're saying is a mix with P plus V notation means it's got to meet all the volumetric requirements and all the performance or BMD requirements. VDOT also has, but you have to look at your contract, which mix is being called for, is a performance only mix. This one's a little different. Um, for this one, 
During the design phase, you're not limited by any volumetric or gradation restrictions. You basically design the mix to, to do the best it can on performance test or BMD test, rutting, cracking, and durability. And once you get that mix design established based on performance test, you then can go into production. Once we go into production, you will have to maintain uh, production tolerances that are in section 211, but you aren't limited to those tolerances during design phase. Uh, where we find the, the requirements for BMD mixes in Virginia or in our VDOT specifications is a special revision. Uh, this special provision uh, spells out the requirements for rutting. Currently in Virginia, we have a, a requirement for rutting, which is to use the APA, the Asphalt Pavement Analyzer. Uh, we're going to go into details on all these tests later on in this presentation. Uh, something new in 2023. For rutting is something called the IDTHT, which is an indirect tension test in high temperature. Uh, there's no official standard yet, but it's being developed here at the Virginia Transportation Research Council. Uh, when it comes to the cracking test, we're using the indirect tensile crack test, uh, which uh, the notation for that is IDT-CT. Um, the durability test, Virginia has elected to use something called the Canabro test. Um, and moisture damage tests, or, or what we've, we've been doing this all along with volumetrics all the way back to the Marshall days, we had something called a TSR. So even though this test, which is considered a performance test now, has been around, and since it's considered a performance test, it's been looped in with the other uh, BMD test as a criteria to look at. But the criteria hasn't changed from what's always been there. Let's, with all these additional tests, let's take just a second and talk about how many specimens you're going to need uh, for, the, uh, uh, for a balanced mix design, BMD mix design. Uh, originally, for volumetrics, we only needed uh, 3, 6, 9, 12 volumetric specimens and 5 permeabilities. So a, a design would have been turned in with 17 specimens made. That's all that you needed. Now, for a BMD mix design, look at the number on this slide, 51 total specimens. That is quite an increase. Uh, the reason being, we're looking at, at cracking, we're looking at rutting, uh, we're looking at everything that's required as part of uh, the mix design phase. Both will still require part B, which is uh, six additional specimens where we do our TSRs, as I mentioned earlier. That was already required as part of a volumetric phase, so that's still there. And um, so those six additional, when you add that, you're looking at a total for a complete new JMF, job mix formula, for a balanced mix design at, you know, 57 specimens. That's quite an increase over what we've done in the past. Let's start talking about how we're going to handle these specimens. Every one of them is a little bit different. Uh, the BMD specimens will be laboratory mixed, laboratory compacted according to ASHTO T312. That stays, that's the way it's always been in the volumetric phase, volumetric design. Uh, basically, it tells us how to prepare our specimens, how to condition it, and how to compact it individually. So that applies whether we're making a, a performance test or BMD test specimen or our normal volumetric specimen. The only, some of the differences you may see in, uh, based on ASHTO T312 is the conditioning time and temperature will vary depending on the test. These times uh, and temperatures are spelled out in the special provision for VDOT, um, but one thing that does remain constant is that you still have to look at ASHTO R30 for the conditioning requirements. There is ongoing research that may adjust these conditioning requirements in the future, so please stay tuned. When we batch our specimens, first thing we want to do, whether we're making a BMD specimen or we're making a volumetric specimen, we want to mimic in the lab what actually happens in the plant. So it's important we pay extra attention to, to our, our, the care we take when we're making our specimens. Um, we're batching here. You can see weighing out in this image trying to get it to the exact weights we need for our proper blend that, that we're establishing during the uh, design phase. 
We always, just as we've always done with volumetrics, whether it be a BMD specimen or not, we want to keep wraps separate. Why do we keep it separate? Because the aggregate's going to be in the oven for hours heating up. We can't uh, put the wrap in for that long. We want to limit it based on VDOT specifications to 30 minutes. So when we add that wrap, it's good to stir it into that hot aggregate and then put the whole specimen back in the oven for 30 minutes. One thing a little different when we mix in a BMD specimen versus a volumetric specimen, and what I mean when I say that is, in the old days when we done a volumetric design, if my liquid binder didn't have an anastrip in it, and I was just doing volumetric sp specimens, it didn't really impact a volumetric test, so it was okay. If I was going to be doing a TSR test, which we now have moved over to a performance BMD test, that anastrip would have to be in there. So it's important, as we noted here, any additives, whether it be a nanostrip additive, a warm mix additive, or a rejuvenator, or anything that we might be adding to our mixes, it needs to be in the mix design binder we're using when we're doing, making our performance test specimens. When it comes time to condition our specimens for short-term oven aging, uh, we, we need to be able to put our specimens in the proper pans, for the proper time. Uh, the specification requires that this mix be placed between one and two inches thick, 25 to 50 millimeters. Note here in this image, you got a gyratory specimen in one size pan. Typical gyratory is 4,800 to 5,000 grams. So it's going to take a larger pan than my IDTCT, which is 2,400 grams. It's half the size. So note, you might need different size pans during the mix design phase, depending on what test you are designing and performing. When we come to condition our specimens, each BMD specimen must be conditioned or aged, I've heard it talk, uh, described both ways, before compacting. This is done through short-term oven aging. Um, and the temperature and time, will, as I stated earlier, it will be explained in the special provision and we'll explain it as we go through each one of these test descriptions in this presentation. But one thing that is constant is during the short term of an agent, we want to stir each mixture in 60 minute increments. So if I'm doing a specimen that I'm aging for two hours before I compact it, at the halfway point at one hour, I need to stir that specimen, all right? And then it stays in there for another hour. Uh, there is a requirement that each one of these specimens must be aged or conditioned individually. In other words, I can't have a large pan that's holding three IDTCT specimens and I'm aging them and conditioning them at the same time. I would have to have three separate individual pans to do this. Now let's start talking about the test procedures. We're going to start with the IDTCT, which is a crack test. Uh, test procedure for this that, we're, that VDOT uh, uh, has assigned or uh, follows is ASTM D8225, uh, determination of crack tolerance index of asphalt mixture using the indirect tensile cracking test at intermediate temperature. It's a mouthful. Um, this test is required during the design phase to be done at the design asphalt content that we established with the volumetrics at a half a percent above and a half percent below. So right here is 15 additional specimens uh, and these are all going to be laboratory mix, laboratory compacted specimens, individually done. We talked about H2R30 for the short term oven aging where you condition your loose mix. For the IDTCT, we're going to follow the special provision and we're going to mix it for four, uh, we're going to condition it for four hours at the compaction temperature. That, during this time, we will be stirring the mix in 60 minute increments. And this is a recommendation just because depending on the size pans you have and the size of your oven, you may have hot spots that aren't quite uniform in temperature. So we recommend as you stir in these specimens, you may place them back in the oven or in a different location to make sure you're getting equal uh, conditioning over all the specimens during the mix design phase. Um, each test uh, value requires an average of five specimens. I mentioned that earlier. So, uh, so it takes, you got to run five specimens, average them together to get one CT index value. Um, 
during the design phase, we're going to recommend you make a couple additional specimens instead of limiting yourself at five. Even though it's a little bit additional work, there are special, there's tolerances on our specimens that we got to meet. They are being the diameter is supposed to, it needs to be 150 millimeters plus or minus two. That's going to be made and, and held strong in your gyratory. Uh, the 62 plus or minus one millimeters, that's going to be based on your gyratory, shouldn't be a problem to meet. But when it comes to compacting this specimen and maintaining seven plus or minus a half percent air voids, you may find you end up outside that range. So you may have to discard that specimen after you spend all the time batching, mixing, and compacting it and having to start with another specimen. So as I'm going through the design phase, typically I want at least one extra peel being made. So I have that, uh, saves me that time later on. The criteria for the IDTCT, uh, I need a, a CT index, which is the value when I run my test, to be greater than or equal than 70. The, uh, the higher the number for the CT index, the better crack resistance. And a new, new tolerance or a new restriction applied to this in 2023 is you got to have a coefficient variability of, of my five test results that has to be less than or equal to 18.3%. So, oh, something during the design phase that we don't have to do during production, but we do, do we do, are required to do during design is um, we need to do some long-term age specimens during the IDTCT. Uh, this will require an additional set of five specimens. These are only required at the design asphalt content. So you'll be making five specimens at your designed binder content that you established during your volumetric portion of the mix design. You're going to do your short-term aging, which we just discussed was four uh, hours at compaction temperature. And at the completion of that, we need to do eight hours aging at 275 degrees Fahrenheit or 135 degrees Celsius for eight hours. And during this time, we don't have to worry about mixing. All right, the special provision that VDOT has wants us to transfer the mix from the one inch to two inch thickness pan to a, a much larger pan that will allow me to spread my mix out in a uniform thickness equal to the nominal maximum aggregate size. So I'm going to need either multiple pans or a larger pan to spread this material out. And rather than stirring it every hour, VDOT has elected to just minimize the uh, opening of the doors so it, your specimens are just in the oven for eight hours. Um, if you do have to open your door for any reason, again, I would recommend uh, adjusting the location so that you get more uniform conditioning during this time. Once my eight hours is done for the long-term oven aging, I need to bring the mixture back up to my compaction temperature, which was the same temperature we used during the short-term short oven aging. And I have 75 minutes to do that. Once the specimen's achieved that, I don't take the whole 75 minutes. I just wait till my specimen achieves that temperature, and then I immediately compact it. Same uh, void range, a uh, same size specimen, 62 millimeters high, 150 millimeters diameter, and the same void range is required for the uh, IDTCTs uh, at intermediate temperature. Now that I've got all my specimens made, uh, I'm ready to move forward into the test procedure. First thing I got to do with my specimen to test it is I got to precondition each specimen. Uh, this is typically done in a water bath, but if I do it in a water bath, one thing I have to do is make sure that specimen stays dry. To keep it dry, it is recommended you double bag them, not single bag. A lot of bags will leak, and, we don't, and right now the requirement is this specimen must stay dry. So if you take two bags that you can reuse over and over and over, um, we'll, we'll put the specimen in two bags, and we, what most of us are doing is putting it in our way bath because it's already set up at 25 degrees Celsius or 77 degrees Fahrenheit. Goes in there for two hours plus or minus 10 minutes. Uh, I do want to note at this time, uh, there's ongoing research that may allow in the future, maybe in 2024 or later, we have to wait and see what happens, there's possibilities these specimens will not long have to stay dry and will be allowed to get wet. But please keep, keep your eye out to see how this may change. 
So uh, when I run my test uh, after the conditioning time, uh, we put it in our test press. Uh, we're going to apply a, a load at 50 plus or minus 2 millimeters per minute and we continue this load at a continuous rate till the load drops below 0.1 kilonewtons. Uh, you can see that demonstrated here in this, this diagram. Um, one thing you do need to note is from the time I've removed my specimen from the, the conditioning chamber, whether it be a water bath or environmental chamber, I only have four minutes or less to actually complete the test. So it means what they're saying here is you conditioned at a certain temperature, they want you to test as quick as you are because while you're testing, that specimen is not maintained at the same temperature. But a test only takes a few seconds. It's really quick. Moving forward, uh, after we finished the, the crack testing, let's move forward into some rut testing or a test that is used for rutting, indicating a rutting susceptible mix. We're going to go into what's called the IDTHT which is the IDT at high temperature. Currently, as I stated earlier, there's no standard procedure for this test. Uh, VDOT at the Research Council is working on it, should be coming out in a year or so. Uh, but this is still a requirement in the VDOT special provision. Right now, this test is only required for informational purposes only. Those of us like myself been in the industry for a while, you know how tests start out for informational purposes only? In the future, it may be more than just informational. So pay attention to this as we go forward. Um, this test will, will give us an indication of the rutting potential of an asphalt mix. And basically, the higher the strength, the better the rut resistance. This quest test currently is only required uh, at the design binder content and a half percent above. One thing better than the, the crack test, which requires five specimens for each test, the IDTHT is only requiring three. So we're getting to make a few less specimens. Uh, we are required to do a short-term oven aging where you condition a loose mix for two hours at compaction temperature. Again, all short-term oven aging, you stir it to 60 minute intervals. Um, again, a recommendation is Depending on your oven, you know your equipment, you may want to rotate the location of your specimens during this two hours. Uh, specimen size is the same as the IDTCT, uh, 150 millimeter diameter, uh, 62 plus or minus 2 millimeters in height, and you compact into the same void level of 7 plus or minus a half. Before testing, we got to condition our specimens. Uh, this is what, where the high temperature comes in. You condition them at 54.4 plus or minus 1 degrees Celsius, which is 130 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, this has to be done for two hours, uh, plus or minus 10 minutes. Just like the IDT CTs, the IDT HTs need to remain dry. Research is being done to possibly allow wet in the future. Uh, Testing uh, must be completed in this case within two minutes because you're at a higher temperature, the specimen is going to want to cool down faster. So once you take it out of your conditioning environment, you need to load it in the equipment and, and run the test right away. Again, it, you can run a test in a matter of seconds, so it doesn't take that long. The strength requirement, uh, minimum strength requirement is greater than or equal to 133 kilopascals. Now let's go into another rutting test, the APA rutting test. Uh, VDOT requires we follow AASHTO T340, uh, which is a standard test method for determining rutting susceptibility of hot mix asphalt using the asphalt pavement analyzer. This test is required at the design binder content and a half percent above, so two different uh, binder contents. To do this, a minimum of four specimens at each at binder contents required, and these specimens will be laboratory mixed, laboratory compacted specimens. Your, your conditioning during the design phase is to condition your loose mix for two hours at compaction temperature before you actually make your specimens. Again, stirring the mix at 60 minute increments. <coughs> Excuse me. The uh, specimen size um, is 150 millimeter diameter but your height is different. Previously we were at 62 millimeters for our specimens. These are taller. They're at 75 millimeters in height. Your void range is the same. It's still seven plus or minus a half percent. 
um, these specimens, once we go into um, the, the testing phase, once we've made our specimens and we're now ready to run the actual rut test, they have to be preconditioned for six hours, uh, for a minimum of six hours and no more than 24 hours at the actual test temperature, which is 64 plus or minus one degrees Celsius. Uh, this can be done in the rut apparatus uh, itself or it can be done in a separate oven, but uh, you have to maintain the same temperature. The test requirements for the APA rut test is, uh, is 8,000 cycles and at the end of 8,000 cycles, it, the rut criteria has to be less than or equal to 8 millimeters. Here's just an example you, of what you would get uh, out of the actual APA rut equipment. Notice here you can see the number of specimens that were run. You had a, an average, you ran two different uh, tests. One, one side, the left side had a rut of 3.968, the right side had a rut of 4.513. Divide that by the two specimens, your average rut for, the, for that asphalt content happens to be 4.2. All right. Next test going forward, after we've done all this, this many specimens, we're still in the mix design phase, is the Canabro. Uh, this test is used to, to measure durability of our mix. Um, to do this, we're going to, that device you just saw, is, this one is an LA abrasion ma machine. Um, going forward, we're going to talk about uh, the test specimens. You need to do it at the design binder content and a half percent below. Think about it, less AC is going to be, more, a mix is going to be more likely to ravel or impact the durability performance of the mix. Uh, that's why we're doing a half percent below. Um, Ashto R30 requires short-term oven aging to condition a loose mix for two hours at compaction temperature before compacting. Again, stir the mix in 60-minute increments. For this test, each, each test requires the average of three gyratory pills. Um, the nice thing is when we done our volumetric part of our, our mix design, we had to make three pills already so we can use those same specimens to turn around running Canabro on. Um, so um, these pills would have been during the volumetric design would have been designed at 50 gyrations and we'd have to meet the criteria of its 150 millimeter diameter with 115 plus or minus 5 millimeters in height. As far as the air voids we just have to meet the, the design criteria for volumetrics. So to run the Canabro test uh, we follow uh, Ashto T401 um, and the first thing you have to do in order for us to measure our voids, we had to measure in our specimens in water. Well, we have to dry each specimen back to a constant uh, weight. And according to the test procedure, it tells you to dry your specimen overnight. I know it's an Ashto's test procedure, but I don't like the term overnight because overnight for me is typically five or six hours, where my wife, it's eight plus. That could be a difference in time, but in order to measure whether or not we've actually dried the specimens out, it is that we weigh these specimens in two hour intervals and we need to make sure we've achieved a constant weight. So as long as you have the, the measurement at least two of them in a row at the same weight, you know you've dried your specimen out. Once my temperature, once I've, I've dried my specimen, um, oh, and I failed to mention that the drying temperature we're required to use during this time is 52 plus or minus 3 degrees Celsius or 125 plus or minus 5 degrees Fahrenheit. So, um, but once we've achieved the constant mass, we, we need to now adjust our specimens to testing temperature. This takes four hours of maintaining a temperature at 25 plus or minus 1 degrees Celsius. Again, this must remain dry, so you're going to need some sort of environmental chamber or something to maintain these specimens at that temperature. Um, an alternative procedure uh, to drying these out, as you can see shown here in this di uh, on this slide, is uh, Ashto, oh, excuse me, ASTM D7227, which is a rapid drying of compacted asphalt specimens using the vacuum drying. 
this would take this special piece of equipment, it's called a core dry. I'm not promoting anybody need to go out and buy this. There's an alternative test to allow you to do it the other way. But if you do, you will be able to dry your specimens at a much quicker rate versus overnight. Um, again, uh, once I've dried my specimens, and the way I verify that I've dried them is I check my weight after each cycle and I need two tests in a row at constant weight or constant mass so that I know my specimens are, the, are, are completely dry. I then need to adjust these specimens to testing temperature for four hours. Again, 25 plus or minus one degree Celsius, whether it be an environmental chamber or something, but it, they do have to stay dry. When it comes to running the Canterbro test, we are going to um, first weigh the specimen. All right, the first specimen is weighed. We record that weight. Then we place this specimen in the LA uh, drum with, without no steel spears. So it's the, the only thing in this drum is the specimen itself. And it, gets, uh, it rotates for 300 revolutions. Um, and at the end of that time, we take the specimen out. We're going to clean it off with a cloth, just something lightly. Uh, we're not going to scrub it. We're just going to lightly clean it off. Once we've done that, we're going to weigh it again. So the test is very easy to run. We only need two weights. Um, from there, we can calculate the mass loss. The mass loss by specification has to be less than or equal to 7.5% of the total weight, or total original weight. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of this, the, even though we've always done TSRs in the volumetric uh, portion of, of uh, our design, VDOT has elected to move this, since it's actually a performance test, into the B BMD criteria. Still follow the same test procedure and the same requirements. Uh, we, we follow an AASHTO T283. Uh, it's nothing new for BMD. But, and this is required now as part B of the job mix formula approval. So for that to happen, we will be doing it once we actually start production of this mix which is a big benefit. So we're actually running the TSR on field produce or plant produce mix. mix. Uh, to do this, you got to prepare at least six spec specimens for each test, have to be tested dry, have to be tested after a <coughs> three straw cycle or conditioning. And we recommend that uh, you make a few additional specimens just as we show with all the other tests in this presentation in case you're outside of the air void requirement you'll have a couple extra specimens you can use. Alright, since we're actually doing field mix and not plant uh, lab produce mix there's no loose mix conditioning requirement uh, for the TSRs. All we do is bring our mix up to compaction temperature split it out to the right compaction uh, to the specimen weight and, and make our specimens. Um, we want to compact our specimens, same as all the other tests, to seven plus or minus half percent air voids. And depending on whether or not I'm doing a Marshall Hammer specimen, which is four inches or 100 millimeters, or a gyratory specimen, which would be six inches or 150 millimeters, uh, it would depend on our, our specimen height. Uh, once we've made these specimens, these six or eight, if I have a couple extra, and I've bulked them, I got my voids right, the first thing I want to do is, is store them at room temperature for 24 hours. After that one day storage, I want to separate my specimen into two subsets. These two subsets will be at least three specimens each, and I want the average voids of each subset to be as close to, to equal as possible. One subset uh, we're going to condition by saturating one of the subsets to between 70 and 80 percent. And here's another reason you might need an additional specimen. If you oversaturate beyond 80 percent, that specimen is damaged. You want to discard that specimen and bring a new specimen in at this time. Uh, you, you have to by specification. All right, uh, so once we've saturated this set of specimens, we're going to put them in a freezer for a minimum of 16 hours. Uh, after 16 hours of being in a freezer, they'll go in a, a hot water bath, is what I like to call it, which is 60 degrees Celsius for 24 hours. Then, prior to testing these specimens, after multiple days of conditioning and all, I want to put these specimens in a um, water bath at 25 degrees Celsius. They'll be in there for two hours. 
At the same time I'm putting these three specimens in there, they're wet, understand? I want to put my other subset that I kept separate in the same water bath so that all six will be at the same temperature. But the separate subset that's called the dry subset must remain dry. So I need to double bag these like we've done some of the other tests to make sure they stay dry at this time. So all six specimens are in a 25 degree bath and we're ready to do our tests. We perform the test the same as we run the ideal CT. We basically load it in the apparatus. We, we break each specimen. We're just gonna record the maximum strength that each specimen will give us. And we're gonna calculate the uh, tensile strength ratio. Uh, the requirement for a TSR is greater than or equal to uh, 80. All this is the additional test required for a balanced mix design. Another requirement starting in 2023 is a certification. VDOT has, has, has uh, added on the BMD certification to the uh, uh, credentialing program. Um, and that is, you can either achieve that by the standalone BMD class or through this mixed design certification class. Uh, it will require passing both a written exam and a proficiency uh, that includes the BMD. I want to give special recognition to both VTRC and VDOT for their help in the development of this presentation. Stacy, Ilker, Johnny, and Candace, thank you all for your help. With that, if you have any questions, please speak with your proctor in your classroom.